In our Bibles, if you would please, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want to draw our attention again to a couple of verses as I bring a message here this morning out of probably the most popular chapter on Easter, and, and rightfully so, because there probably is no single chapter in all the Bible that deals with the resurrection uh, as thoroughly and as in as many ways as does 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. But if you would please look with me in verse number 12, the Bible again says, Now if Christ, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, isn't this an interesting question? How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So if, if you are saying that Jesus rose from the dead... And that's what Paul, Paul is dealing with. This church would believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But at the same time, they didn't believe that mortal man could be raised from the dead. And then he goes on to say in verse 13, But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and, and your faith is also vain. I want to bring a message this morning with this thought and title in mind, All or Nothing. All or nothing. Father, I pray you bless, please, in this message. May your will be done. Please, Heavenly Father, may you, your will be done in all of our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A little boy and his mother were shopping for Easter candies and decorations, and they ran into their pastor while they were in the store. Mom and pastor, they exchanged a little chit-chat, and well, then the pastor looked at little Johnny and asked, So, so what are you up to today, Johnny? Oh, Johnny said, we're getting ready for Easter, Pastor. And then seeing a, a teaching moment, uh, the, the pastor replied, oh, really? Well, what exactly is Easter anyway, Johnny? Do you know, do you know what happened at Easter? Well, little Johnny looked at his pastor a little offended. Of course I know what Easter is. It's when Jesus went uh, to Jerusalem and he rode on a donkey and they waved palms at him. Well, that's right. Go on, said the pastor. Well, then he got in trouble and he was beat up and yelled at and, and well, then they nailed him on a cross and then he died. Well, very good, Johnny, but what happened next? Well, then they put him in a tomb and they put a big rock in front of it. But do you know, pastor, three days later, he got raised and got out of there. Johnny, that is great, said the pastor, pleased to know that his Sunday school program had been working so well. But that's not all, pastor, said Johnny. Oh, replied the pastor. Well, what else? Well, the rock got rolled back, and he stepped out, and he looked around, and if he sees his shadow, there's six more weeks of winter. <laughs> so I think he got most of it right, but not all of it right. A man and his five-year-old son were driving past the cemetery, and they noticed a large pile of dirt next to a freshly dug grave when the little boy said, Hey, look, Dad, one got out. <laughs> you know, now those words certainly could have been accurately proclaimed, couldn't they not? The morning of Jesus' resurrection, Hey, look, one got out. But not just anyone. This one was Jesus of Nazareth, the one who claimed to be the very Son of God, the promised Messiah who had come to save his people from their sins. You know, the physical bodily resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ has long been the defining factor of the life ministry and teachings of Christ. No resurrection. We don't even know who this Jesus of Nazareth even was. You know, the physical bodily resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ has long been the driving force behind the courage and compassion and conviction of Christ's followers. No resurrection. Do you know there never would have been such a thing as Christians and certainly no movement known today as Christianity? The physical bodily resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ has long been the dividing fight by those who refuse to acknowledge and accept Jesus Christ to be more than just a man. And his word is more than just um, a, uh, a book written by man. No resurrection. There, there are no such labels as atheists, agnostics, infidels, 
or humanist. These, these uh, titles would not even be in existence because these are descriptions. They exist in actuality in contrast to a belief in a personal, self-existent, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and living God and Savior. There, there, was, there were first believers before there were infidels. The word infidel comes in as response to people that say, we don't believe that. We're not, we're not believers in God, so we are, we are atheists. See, one of the main reasons why so many are willing to de deny or ignore the fact, and I say the fact, Amen. of the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ Amen. is because his resurrection forces a person to face the reality of eternity, that there is life beyond the grave. Amen. That's what the resurrection does. Amen. It forces people to face the fact and the reality Amen. that when we die here, doesn't mean everything ends there, but there is, in fact, life after the grave. If Jesus Christ is alive, then eternity is a real existence. If Jesus Christ is alive, then eternity is the real existence. This life is really only a prequel to the real and lasting life that is to come for those that have put their faith and trust in Christ. If Jesus Christ is alive, then eternity is a present existence. It's something that is happening even right now. Now, notice, if you will, again, verse number 12, an, an odd teaching, kind of a, you know, this is my initial illustration where the little boy got most of the story right, but he, but he added a few things at the end and, and kind of messed it all up. Well, that was kind of a problem going on in the church of Corinth. They had some of the belief of the resurrection, right, but they had some things very wrong, and it was kind of an odd teaching, false teaching had crept into this church. Again, notice in verse number 12, now, if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead. There was no debating that. The, the Corinthian believers, so to speak, if you want to call them that, had no problem in acknowledging that Jesus rose from the dead. But at the same time, then, on the contrast, they had another belief. How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But they didn't believe in the bodily resurrection of mortal man. So in spite of the clear teaching throughout the Old Testament, Jesus himself, the apostolic preaching, and especially of that of the Apostle Paul, many of the Corinthians had come to a place, and as contradictory and as confusing as it sounds, nonetheless, here they were, where they did not believe in the bodily resurrection of mortal men, including themselves. They just simply believed that when you died, that was it. But they did believe that Jesus rose from the dead. See, Greek philosophers of that day believed in the immortality of the soul, but they rejected any possibility of the resurrection of the body. Many of these Corinthian church members had adopted what I'm going to call a fusion faith. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, where you take two things that aren't necessarily the same and you make them work together. Like today, there are food, food fusions. You know what I mean? You take a couple different uh, ethnicities and you merge them together, you know, and you get, you know, you might take Italian and take, let's say, Hispanic food and, and merge them together, which I'm all for, by the way. I, I'm all for them on their own and I'm all for them together. It's kind of like at Thanksgiving when you take a bite of uh, mashed potatoes and cranberry sauce and, and turkey and dressing and you, you, you get all, everything on your plate in one scoop. Did any of you do that? Anybody, just me? You try to get that perfect bite kind of fusion. You know, you, you know, not just something you just you can have a, a whole bowl of it together, but you just kind of make it work. Well, that's kind of an odd fusion. Now, what they did is they were fusing Christian beliefs with worldly philosophies and practices. So they were, they were willing to adopt certain things that the Christian faith believed, but they were not willing to abandon all of the worldly philosophies that they had been taught, and they wanted to make them work together. Now, what they were believing to be true would be similar to believing in libraries filled with books while denying that anyone could actually read. Or believing that grocery stores are filled with food, but denying that people are even able to eat. Or that highways and pave, and you believe in highways and paved roads, but you deny that people actually own and drive cars. You're like, why would I believe the one if I'm not going to believe the other? Uh, you, you, they kind of, you know, right, they work together. If you believe that there are books, somebody has to be able to read because somebody had to write them. No, that's not true. I, I acknowledge the existence of all these books, but I deny the fact that anyone can read. 
Uh, I acknowledge the fact that there's food in these grocery stores, but I deny the fact that people actually eat. Uh, I acknowledge the fact there are roads and highways all around us, paved roads, but I deny the fact that there's such a thing as an automobile and that people drive. You, you follow me? It's kind of a self-contradictory system here. Why believe the one if you're not going to believe the other? It's kind of all or nothing, both or neither. See, these odd, conflicting, and self-defeating fusions, believe it or not, we're not, are not unique to these Corinthians. You know, there are people today that believe in celebrating the birth of Jesus without believing that his death, burial, and resurrection were for, were for the forgiveness of their sins so that they could know 100% for sure that heaven is their home. Think about that. There are people who believe in celebrating the birth of Jesus, God's Son, into this world, but don't believe that, you, that, that, was, that it's important to know for sure that when we die, we're going to heaven, that the reason why he was born is so that we can be saved. Well, they go together. There are people that believe believe it or not, in going to church without believing in God. There are people that believe in God and even that they're Christians, but they don't believe that the Bible is true. There are people that believe in celebrating Easter and even believe that they're celebrating his resurrection from the dead, but they don't believe it's important to trust in Jesus as their Savior in order to have eternal life. Well, that is a fusion of faith. These are contradictory, self-defeating beliefs. If I believe the one, then I should believe the other. But if I don't believe the other, then why do I believe the one? If I don't believe I can know for sure before I die by putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone, then why would I even believe in him at all? Because that's why he came. His whole purpose of coming was to save us from our sins. Paul took the argument of Jesus' critics and he ran it to its natural conclusion. I think in the, in the world of debate, that's called ad hominem, where you so, sort of take, you give somebody their, their premise and you say, okay, we'll, we'll work with that. I don't, I don't believe with what you're saying. And I, I think it's a bad premise, but what, you know what we'll do? We'll go with your premise and we'll, we'll acknowledge your premise is true. But then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of follow it to its natural conclusion to show how absurd that premise really is. We're going we're to we're work it all the way out to the end and show you that that just simply cannot be true. So here is the premise that there's no resurrection from the dead. Okay, so Paul's basically saying, okay, we'll work with that. You are saying that there is no resurrection from the dead. Now, this is a universal negative. In other words, there cannot be a positive with the universal negative. There cannot be any exceptions. If there is no bodily resurrection from the dead, if that is your premise, you can't have it both ways. Uh, so there's no resurrection from the dead. There's no bodily resurrection from the dead. Then here are a few things that we have to look at. Number one, then we serve a dead Savior. If there is no bodily resurrection from the dead, then we serve a dead Savior. Notice in verse number 13 what the Bible says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? You can't have it both ways. It doesn't make sense for you to say that Jesus rose from the dead, but no one else can raise from the dead. Then why did he raise from the dead to begin with? If you look at verse number 16, the Bible says, for if the dead rise not, notice what the Bible says, then is Christ not raised, is not raised from the dead. Jesus would then have been an imposter. And a man to be despised and looked upon with disdain. If there is no bodily resurrection. Now think about this. If a person does not believe in the bodily resurrection of the dead, then you should not celebrate Jesus. You should not celebrate Jesus Christ. You should not call him a good man. You should not call him a great teacher. You shouldn't because he's a deceiver. He's a deceiver. He was a hoax artist. He was someone that spread lies. He's somebody that was willing to allow his followers to die for him because of teaching that he rose from the grave. So if there is no resurrection of the dead, then we serve a dead Savior. If there's no resurrection of the dead, secondly, then we preach a deceitful message. Then we preach a deceitful message. Again, look at verse number 14, if you would, please, the first part. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching, what is that next word? Vain, empty, meaningless, worthless. Right. Look at verse 15, if you would, please. Yea, and, and, and even worse, we are found to be what? False witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So again, using that premise. 
If there is no resurrection from the dead, then we serve a dead Savior. Secondly, we are deceitful witnesses. Outside of all of our churches, we ought to put God's false witnesses. And we are a pack of liars if there's no resurrection from the dead. I don't think this is sounding too good so far, do you? Thirdly, then we have a defeated faith. Then we have a defeated faith. Look at verse 14, if you would, please. The, the second part. And your faith also is vain. Notice, if you would, verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. And look at the sad, natural outcome. Ye are yet in your sins. We would be trusting in a dead man to save us from our sins. So you see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a testament of God accepting Jesus' atonement on our behalf. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. You see, if Christ is not risen, then God rejected Christ's payment. Remember we talked about that, that this receipt, this receipt is proof of payment. This receipt is proof that, you know, if you have to take something back, right, you don't like it, it, it doesn't fit well, uh, it doesn't operate properly, uh, you take it back and they want to know, do you have a receipt? Now, they want to know that you have a receipt because they want to make sure that you bought that, a proof of purchase. You show them the receipt, and that is a tangible, physical proof of purchase that, that was paid for. You see, if Jesus Christ did not rise, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus could not have risen from the dead. His bones are still in the tomb, and then there is no receipt. There is no proof of payment. There has been no payment for our sins, and then we're without hope because can there be anyone any more wonderful if God God rejected Jesus. If Jesus did not come back from the grave, that means God rejected him. Because Jesus himself said, when you take this, when you kill this body and you, you tear this temple down, three days and three nights later, I'm bringing it back. Right. Yeah. And his enemies knew that. He, they knew that Jesus, the great sign that he had, remember they said, show us a sign. And what was the sign he said? Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. Even so shall the Son of Man, right, come, come back. And that means we have no hope. Can it be possible for anyone to be any more worthy than Jesus? Anyone more loved of the Father than Jesus? Any more perfect and holy than Jesus? If God rejected him, then ladies and gentlemen, there is no hope if there be no resurrection from the dead. You know, fourthly, we'll never see our departed loved ones again. They are lost to us forever. At the funeral services, I often will say, this is not a goodbye, but it's till we meet again. But if the dead be not raised, it is goodbye. Yeah. It's the last time we will ever see our departed loved ones Again, notice, if you will, verse 18. Then they also which are asleep, fallen asleep in Christ, that's a good way of saying people that have trusted Christ who are dead, fallen asleep in Christ, are, what does the Bible say? Perished. And let me say, fifthly, then we have a depressing existence and outlook. Look at verse 19. If this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. In other words, life that has no meaning, life that has no purpose, life that has no value. I mean, there's no moral truth. There's no absolute right. There's no absolute wrong. If, Jesus, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus did not rise from the dead. And the Bible is, is, a, is a book filled with lies because the Bible talked about Jesus coming back from the dead, did it not? And the Bible foretold of that and, and, and teaches us that. So if Jesus, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus did not, not, did not come back from the dead. And we can't even trust the Bible. There's no standard of absolutely, absolute right. And there's no standard of absolute wrong. 
And then there is no justice in the universe. There's no meaning to life. There's no set of standards that we, have, we should have to go by. I mean, if there is no God and there is no truth, then, then why do we even worry about what anybody thinks? The worst thing I could do is worry about what you think or anyone else thinks because it doesn't matter anyway. Because when you die, you're dead. When I die, I'm dead. I'm not going to stand before God. You're not going to stand before God. I'm not going to have to give an account. You're not going to have to give an account. And who gets to determine what's right? And who gets to determine what's wrong? And who gets to determine what I should do and what I shouldn't do? If if there's no God, then you can't make yourself a God in my life, and I can't make myself a God in your life. Live and let live. How many of you ever heard that phrase before? Live and let live. That would be true. If there's no God, then the best thing I can do is just live it up. Why not? That's all there is. I'm not going to get a badge for living a selfless life. I'm not going to get a reward for being sacrificial. There's no value in being virtuous. There's a medallion and be immoral. And what is morality? That's just your opinion versus my opinion. I mean, it becomes like an animal kingdom. Survival of the fittest. And it would be right. Because we're just a bunch of animals that are highly evolved more than the other animals. If there's no God. I don't imagine in the animal kingdom a couple of lions, you know, there's one wildebeest, and one lion looks at the other and says, now listen, we've got to be more civilized than this. You're hungry and I'm hungry. This is a mighty big wildebeest. Let's be gentle lions. Let's discuss this. You take half and I take half. But now listen, you and I have gotten older. Our bellies have been full for many years. The young cubs around us, they deserve this. Let's, let's not worry about us right now. What do you say we be reasonable? What do you say we not even eat this wildebeest? Uh, let's, let's do this. Let's just divide it up and give it to the next generation so they can have it better than us. Now, is that the way animals behave? I mean, those lions, they could care less of any, that lion at that time could care less of anybody else eats. It's going to eat. It's going to take care of itself. And they'll kill each other over a wildebeest. If there's no God, the end result is anarchy. The end result is barbarianism. The end result is every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. From the earliest part of his ministry, Christ built the legitimacy of his ministry upon his ability to raise himself from the dead. He literally put everything at stake on if he comes back alive, every, if he can raise himself from the dead, everything he said about himself and taught is true, all of it. But if he doesn't come back, then he's a false prophet and he's a liar. He rises from the dead. He is exactly who he claimed to be. His bones remain in the grave. He is a hoax and a false prophet. He raises from the dead. He is sent from God and speaks only the truth. His bones remain in the grave. He is no one special and speaks only lies. Now, Paul used that premise, and he kind of worked it down its natural conclusion. And I think most people hearing that are going to say, well, I don't like the way that sounds. But then Paul says in verse number 20, but don't you like this? But now is Christ risen from the dead? and become the first fruits of them that slept. So now we know it's an established fact. So since we know that Jesus, we're not going to start with there's no resurrection from the dead. That's not where we're going to start from and then build our, build our, our case from that point. But we're going to start out with this. Jesus Christ is risen from the grave. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Hey, listen, something changed and revolutionized his followers. Something happened to these followers who were, who were hiding as cowards and hiding to save their own necks. After the death and crucifixion and even burial of Jesus, something happened that revolutionized the way they served and, and revitalized their faith and their courage. And it wasn't just an empty tomb. Uh, that would not have been enough. And it wasn't just Jesus surviving the crucifixion and somehow getting out of the grave and limping back to them all beat up and scarred up. Can you think about that? There are people that believe that. If he was able to rescue himself, survive the crucifixion, do you think that they would look at him and say, Our Messiah! They'd say, somebody get an ambulance, even though they didn't exist back then. I don't know what they called it. Get an amb ambulance chariot. I don't know. 
And then if, and if his spirit were to make its way back, but not his body, that would have done nothing either. With his bones still being in a tomb. But the fact is, the Bible teaches that to over 500 people, Jesus showed himself that he, in fact, is alive. Bodily, physically, he rose from the grave. He said, touch my hands, touch my feet, put your hand on my side. No, it's me. I am alive. So now is Christ risen from the dead. Now, since we know that, there are a lot of other things then we can conclude. See, because he lives, there is proof that he was God sent. His resurrection then validates everything that he taught and everything that he claimed. In other words, every single thing that Jesus taught, we know is true. The victory of Jesus' resurrection validated uh, the fact that he claimed to be God in the flesh, equal to God the Father. He claimed to be able to forgive sins. Hey, listen, he claimed to have all power in heaven and on earth. Jesus claimed to be the truth. He claimed to be the only one to heaven. Jesus claimed to be able to give eternal life to all those that put their faith and trust in him. Think about this. If you're here today, and if you were to die today or next year or 10 years or 30 years, do you know where your soul is going to go? Now, we've established the fact Jesus is risen from the dead. That means there is life after death. That means that this life is not all that it is. That means that, the, that, the, that, there, that we, we, we exist somewhere beyond this world. Do you know 100% for sure without a doubt? Now think about this. If you believe in God, and you believe in the Bible, and you believe in Jesus, then to not know for certain that heaven is your home contradicts everything else you claim to believe. Because everything you just claim to believe is for the sole purpose of knowing for sure. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. That means that right now, if you will invite Jesus Christ into your heart and life and turn to him as your personal Savior, you can know without a shadow of a doubt when your time comes and you're passed from this life that you'll go to heaven and be with Jesus forever, all because he's alive. It also vindicated all of his followers from feeling deceived. Do you think that any of his followers ever wondered if they were following someone and something that was too good to be true? You think they ever got discouraged? You think they ever thought to themselves, is this even worth doing? Is this even worth giving our lives to? Is this even, does this even matter? Because Jesus rose from the grave, if we follow his teachings, no matter how hard it gets here, and no matter how challenging it gets here, and no matter how difficult it gets here, there's a purpose behind everything. And God's will can be accomplished despite all difficult times are. And he promised us he would never leave us nor forsake us. That means that he's even with us in all of our trials. Uh, he also promised us that to be absent from the body is to what? To be present with the Lord. So we know we're going to eventually be with him forever. And so we know that no matter what goes on here, because he's alive, it's going to be okay. Hey, nothing means nothing. There's value to life. And it's all because we serve a risen Savior. Albert Einstein, the great physicist in Time Magazine's Man of the Century, was once traveling on a train when the conductor came down the aisle punching tickets. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his vest pocket, but he couldn't find his ticket. So he reached in his other pocket. It wasn't there either, so he looked in his briefcase, but he couldn't find his ticket. Well, then he looked in the seat beside him, and he couldn't find it there. The conductor finally said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Well, the conductor continued down the aisle punching tickets. As he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around, and there he saw the great physicist on his hands and knees, now looking under his seat for his ticket. The conductor rushed back, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are, no problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Finally, Albert Einstein responded with great concern. He said, young man, 
I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I am going. The whole purpose of getting that ticket was not just to get on the train, but to arrive at where he was going. The whole purpose of believing, do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe in the cross, in the resurrection? Do you believe in a real heaven? Well, all of that is so you and I can know where we're going. Know where we're going. Well, nobody can know that. Well, that's not what the Bible, the whole purpose of Jesus coming and dying and coming back from the grave is so we could know that. These things have I written unto you, 1 John 5, 13, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye might, may know that ye have eternal life. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, talking about Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, asking him for salvation, what does the Bible say? Shall be saved. When you pass from this life to the next, do you know where you will be going? You might feel, feel pretty sure and confident about who you are as things stand right now. You see, that's the false deception we get sometimes. We have so much confidence in who we are. We have so much confidence in our standing at work or our standing in the community or our, or our affluence or maybe our, 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 uh, our vitality of health or just the fact that we can say, you know, I don't, I'm not worried about that. Uh, I'm okay. I'll just deal with it then. I don't know. There's something empowering maybe people feel about that. Be able to make those claims. Maybe there's something, I don't know, that just kind of makes a person feel like I'm as, I'm as, I'm as smart as God. I'll just wait as if we're submitting to a human authority to have to accept the fact we don't know, but we should know. As if the fact that we are, that we are coming under a human authority in some way or coming under the authority of a church or a religion or a man, by just being honest with the fact that we, if we believe in God and we believe in the Bible, we believe in Jesus, we believe in heaven, then we have to believe in life after death. Yeah, right. yeah. J.C. Ryle once said, there's no greater fool than he who is willing to live unprepared to die. That's right. That's it's not coming under the authority of a church to get that settled. Yep. It's not coming under the authority of a pastor to get that settled. It's not coming under the authority of a, of, a, of a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad or a, a daughter or a son or, a, or a, a, a friend at work. We're not submitting to a human being and acknowledging, I don't know where I'm going to go, but I ought to know where I'm going to go. And I don't know where I'm going to go, but God says I can. And so I want to know you are not and I am not submitting to a religion. We are submitting to God himself, the one that we will stand and give an account to, who is the ultimate judge, because he's God. And here's what God said. God says he loves us. God says he wants to forgive us because we have sinned against him, right? We all have. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. God says, I want all of you to be in heaven with me forever. So much that I'm going to send my own son to be born of a virgin, live a perfect life, die on a cross that he did not earn, and die for the sins of all mankind for all time. And I'm going to raise him up from the dead three days and three nights later to show that I've, conquered, that I've received this payment and he's conquered death and conquered the grave. And here's how simple I'm going to make it. Because there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. There's nothing we can do to work for and get it. If we could, then he wouldn't have sent Jesus. Here's how simply he makes it. He calls it a gift. If you will receive my son, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but through me. If you'll receive my son as your Savior. Here's what God says to us. I will forgive you of all your sins, past, present, future. 
I will adopt you into my family, and you will live with me forever in a place called heaven. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. It's not talking about physically. This body is going to die. It's talking about our soul, who we really are. Our soul will live forever with Christ. And then here's what Jesus asks. And I end with this question to you this morning. Believest thou this? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed this morning, if we could. Maybe you are here. And you believe in God, and you believe in the Bible, and you believe in Jesus. You believe there's a heaven, and you believe God loves you. But if you are being real honest between you and God, this is not a question that you are really answering to me as a human, though I'm, 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 I'm simply standing in place of what the Bible teaches. But you don't know for sure that heaven's your home. If you were to die today, you cannot say for sure that you know that you would be in heaven. This has nothing to do with being a member of Frederick Baptist Church. This has nothing to do with about being a Baptist. This has nothing to do with following uh, any, anybody's religion. This has to do with why Jesus came to begin with and why he died and why he rose from the grave. It's so that we can know for sure that heaven is our home. Because truth of the matter is, once we die, whatever has to be done, it's too late. Whatever has to happen for us to have eternal life has to happen while we're alive. And God did everything necessary for you and I to be able to go to heaven by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So maybe that's you this morning, and you don't know for sure heaven is your home. Right where you're at, right where you're sitting this morning, and those of you watching live stream, right where you're at, if you believe that you're a sinner, and you know that, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, there's none righteous, no, not one. Do you believe that? Do you believe the fact that because we sin, we sin against God? The wages of sin is death. We sin against God. God's the one we sin against, and we deserve to be punished for that which we did. We're, we're the ones guilty, and the Bible says what we've earned because of our sin is death or separation from God forever. That's what we deserve. But then believe that God loves you. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He wants to forgive you. Do you believe that? Do you believe he loves you? Then right now where you're at, if you'll simply pray this prayer in your heart, the words aren't magical. It's not just simply this pray this prayer and it, the, the words do the magic. It's what you believe as you pray. If as you pray this, you are believing this, God promises he'll answer this prayer and he'll give you eternal life. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner but I know you love me. The best that I know how, I open up my heart and ask you to please come in. Please forgive me of all my sin. Please be my personal Savior. I now put all my faith and all my trust only in you. Thank you for dying for my sins on the cross. Thank you for rising from the dead to give me eternal life. I now accept you as my Savior. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, with no one looking around the room, would there be someone that just right now you prayed that prayer and you just in your heart turned to God for salvation? No one's looking around the room. No one's going to come to you. But I want to be able to rejoice with you that on this Resurrection Sunday morning, you just made the most important decision of your entire existence. Is there someone here today that would say, Pastor C, I just now prayed that prayer, and I'm not ashamed to give testimony of it. I just now prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to be my Savior. Would you raise up your hand real quickly so I can just acknowledge that? No one's going to come to you. No one's going to embarrass you. But just now you prayed that prayer. You just asked Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Savior. How important this is. He, this is why he came. So we can know for sure heaven is our home. Would there be anyone at all? Say, Pastor, see, that's me. I just prayed that prayer. I just now ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior. We're not asking you to join the church. We're not asking you to do anything, but just simply acknowledge you received the gift of eternal life that God wants you to have. Is there anyone like it at all? Say, Pastor, see, I prayed that prayer, and I'm not ashamed to testify of, this, this, of me turning turn to Christ as my Savior. 
Now, if you are saved and you're a born-again child of God, because he lives, we have his new life. And he wants our lives to reflect this resurrection life. He wants us to live in a way that demonstrates that we truly are alive in Christ. There is a difference between us and those that don't know him as Savior. There is a difference between us and those that don't believe in the Bible. There is a difference between us and those that, that don't believe that God is real. Because we have his life. It ought to be making a difference in everything that we say and everything that we do. Because he is worthy. Father, I pray you bless in this time of invitation. And I do pray, if there's someone here that does not know you as Savior, Father, I pray that whatever it takes, you would do what's necessary to show them your love for them, for them the, the importance of them getting this settled, as we only have so much time to get this taken care of. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed next week, next month, next year. But we will have to, at some point in time, give an account as to whether or not we put our faith and trust in you or whether we try to do things on our own. I pray today if there's someone here that wasn't quite ready in their mind to accept you as their Savior, oh God, please continue to burn this message deep into their heart and soul and not leave them alone until the day comes where they finally turn to you and put their trust and faith only in you as their Savior. Father, help us as those who are saved to live a life that honors and glorifies this decision. And Father, may we be a witness to others around us to let them know what we know. Bless, please, in our time of invitation, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.